Welcome back to the Motorhome Matt podcast. I'm Keith Gooden. And I'm Motorhome Matt. You right there, Keith? You're looking a bit peaky, mate. <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube, you'll realise I'm not joined today by Keith in this episode. This is Reggie, our very own, yeah, hello, mate, our very own Border Terrier. Let's give you a little treat. You're doing very well, aren't you? Now, Reggie is proudly donning his very own dog robes, kindly given to him by our sponsor for this episode, the amazing dog robes. Thank you, Margaret. We're talking this week about travelling with your pets. Now, there's lots of information out there on travelling with dogs, but less information on travelling with iguanas, travelling with hamsters and parrots, and these are all questions we often get asked. So I thought I would catch up with Margaret to find out a little bit more about this amazing doggy dressing gown, if I can call it that. It comes with these awesome mitts as well, the gauntlets that you can use to rub them down. They keep them clean, keep them warm, and dry them really, really fast. Reggie loves his. So I caught up with Margaret to tell us a bit more about dog robes and tell us a little bit more about her adventure with her own dog, Missy. So Margaret, hello, it's lovely to have you with us. How are you? I am really good. I am so excited to be here because <laughs> I'm a big fan of the podcast. Oh, bless so you. So I'm very excited. It was lovely to meet you in Birmingham. And can I just say a massive thanks for my mitts? <laughs> <laughs> and Reggie's dog. So yes, we love this. Reggie loves it. And you've very kindly branded it, branded it for us as well. We love it. Thank you yeah. so much. These are so warm as well. They're great. So tell us a bit about dog robes. How did you get into selling these? Dog robes have actually been making tails wag since 2004. <laughs> but I took over from my neighbour about sort of nine years ago, something like that. She wanted to retire. I was becoming an empty nester. And a mutual friend said, well, why don't you just take over Anne's business? And I thought, well, never run my own business before but yeah let's give it a go she said well you can sew you can make them so I did to start with um I made about four or five hundred to start oh, with wow. and then they just all sold and yeah and so now um I've got help from a couple of manufacturers in in Scotland we're made in Britain but um the the manufacturers that we have at the minute are actually in Scotland and yeah they make hundreds and hundreds a month for us. So it's That's great. amazing. So tell us a bit about the merits of dog bro. What's it for? Do you know, they dry your dog quickly in around 30 minutes. They keep them warm and they comfort them. They protect surroundings from wet, muddy shake off and they stop the wet dog smell because they dry your dog so quickly. Yeah. Um, the secret is our own super absorbent fabric. That's the key. It's lightweight. It's a lightweight toweling fabric and it absorbs the moisture and it's got longer loops on the inside. So they trap the dog's body heat, absorb all the moisture and yeah, just do what it says. They dry your dog in 30 minutes. Now this one has come out of the wash and they it's so soft. I might wear it myself. Yeah. <laughs> but they're machine washable, aren't they as well? Yeah. Machine wash, tumble dry on low. The, the reason caravan and motorhome owners love them is because they're single layered. The dog robe's single layered, so it's really quick to dry. So you right. can reuse it again. So it's great. And there's no Velcro. There's no Velcro to get clogged with dog hair or dried grass, sand, you know, just ties on the dog and yeah, away you go. Yeah, really, really easy to use. Reggie loves his. Thank you so much. We love it. <laughs> He's very yeah, happy. In it his was dog the road. least I could do. No, it's great. It so now you've travelled as well, haven't you? We're talking this week about travelling with a pet, and you did. You were telling me you did a couple of big European trips with Missy, your it dog. Did. Well, sadly, we lost Missy in August. But as oh. the vet said, if she had done her trip. Uh, the trips that Missy had done in the last six months of her life, she'd be really happy. So <laughs> Missy was in, Missy was, we did a couple of trips in 2022. We went to the Netherlands in May. So we did DFDS ferries um, from Newcastle to Amsterdam in the May. And then in July, we did Paris. So we went on the shuttle Folkestone to Cali. So she was there as well. Um, and yeah, it was great. It was really good. The vet, you know, obviously because of the animal health certificate, the dog's got to be checked at the vet. And she said, yeah, she's doing really well. She'll be fine to go. So 
off we went. But she was 15 at the time, bless oh, her. Oh, wow. 15, and she, yeah. And she did both trips and had a ball. Loved it. We went in one of the pet-friendly cabins, but we met a lot of motorhome um, owners there doing the, the crossing from Newcastle to Imauda. Yeah, we did the pet-friendly cabin, which was great. Loved the pet-friendly cabin, but as soon as you go onto the ship, you're steered down the corridor to the pet-friendly cabins, and that's really it. Apart from mm. moving to the end of the cabin, the hallway to the exercise area outside, you're kind of contained. You can't really go anywhere else in the ship with the dog. Um, but there's an exercise area where everybody was gathering and chatting about their experiences and whatnot. So it was good. It was an overnight um, ferry. Um, so it was fairly long, but it was really great to get across to, to Amsterdam from Newcastle to, to do that trip. And um, it was, yeah, the Netherlands was really dog friendly. We were really surprised. And what was it like going on the tunnel then with the dog? great as well it was easy we stayed in the car and you know everything was just handing over the pet passport um as we went through and the same at the other end whereas when we went on the shuttle we had to get out um out of the car went to the pet reception um handed over all our paperwork there and back into the car but on the way back um we just stayed in the car um, at the Cali side and um, handed over our paperwork. It's a really easy process to travel with your pet. Um, it just requires, like everything, just a bit of thought beforehand and a bit of planning. And what did all that cost then per trip? Because obviously there's a cost per trip now, isn't there, for going abroad with a dog? Yes, it cost a couple of hundred pounds for the animal health certificate. And apparently you can get it anything between like £70 and 230 But the, the key thing to remember is we did two trips, but unfortunately one pet passport did, doesn't cover you for the two trips. No. Because we went to two different countries. So, and they're translated into the appropriate destination language. So you, we had to have one pet passport to go to the Netherlands and another pet passport to go to France. Um, so it cost a couple of hundred pounds each time. In the Netherlands, um, it cost us something like three, four euro. That was it. I was so surprised to get the tablet for the dog oh, wow. and, you know, to have it stamped in the pet passport. That was it. That was an Alkmaar. Um, and then on in Paris, it was it, they charged for the consultation and everything. So it was something like 60 euros. So there's, you know, there's a big difference in what vets are charging. Yeah. But it but it was an easy enough process. I've never come out of a vet with a bill less than a hundred pounds, let alone three or four euros. <laughs> I, exactly. I, I was like, what is that it? You know? Well, yeah, that's I mean, amazing. it was only, bless her, Missy was only like 2.2 .2 kilos. So she needed half of one of those little tablets. And yeah, it was just three, three something euro. What would your advice be to people looking to prepare? for a European trip in the car or the motorhome or the caravan, uh, and yeah. they want to take yeah. their dog specifically with them. What would your advice be as they think about that now for a trip maybe later in this year? Advice would be go to your vet, do your homework, go on the government website, um, look at what your dog needs. Does your dog need a rabies injection? Give yourself plenty of time, speak to your own vet, make your appointments for your own vet. And then make your appointment for where you're going to be one to five days before you land back in the UK. And you can have your vet appointment there and that's it done. You can just done. enjoy your holiday then. And you've made Reggie famous. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell him. Well, it was the least I could do because I'll tell you, everything I've learned about motorhomes um, and, you know, all the places that I should be going, it, it's come from motorhome map podcast it's oh, fab i've learned so great. much so thank you <laughs> thank you very much margaret it's been an absolute pleasure lovely to see you again and uh, yeah we'll keep in touch thank you for sure thanks so much bye
We've got a very special offer for you. Get 15% off your dog robes order at thatleisureshop.com. Simply enter the discount code REGGIE15 at the checkout. So a lot has changed when it comes to the rules around travelling with dogs, with cats and with ferrets, particularly when it comes to heading off on a European motorhome adventure. So I thought I would get the lowdown and unpack the facts. And we caught up with local and BBC star vet... Mr. James Greenwood. James, thank you so much for inviting us here to your beautiful home. Uh, We're here with Dolly. Yeah, we are. (laughs) She's off camera, but she's walking around. No doubt she'll make a contribution as well. So, James, we're talking a little bit about travelling with pets, but before we do that, tell us a little bit about your recent exploits and your recent celebrity status. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, no, thank you. It's great to be. It's great to be here. I'm very excited to be on the podcast. So, I, I I'm a, I am a vet. I'm, I'm practicing vet, but I also do do some television stuff on the side. So, I started out weirdly in uh, it was slight detour into television through the Great Pottery Throwdown. Um, because I, as well as being a vet, I love ceramics, and then and then I just kind of led into different sort of different opportunities. Did a kids show that went on CBBC uh, called The Pets Factor, which which I'm very proud of. Great for the younger audience. Um, and now I do quite a bit of live stuff um, on Morning Live as well. So yeah, so it's, it's quite a few different sort of programs I've been involved with, but. I love it, and it's getting a you know strong message out to the audience and stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's great for kids, isn't it, to see as you were saying earlier what goes on inside a veterinary practice with their with their loved one. Yeah, exactly. And I think you know it's one of those things where I was I was really nervous when um, when we started sort of talking about doing television. There's something very disarming about the idea of a camera following you around at work and you know sort of picking up everything that you're doing. But I think, you know, if, if, I was, if I was a youngster watching that show, I would just absolutely love it because, you know, you're getting to see behind the scenes. But also, you know, we get quite a lot of parents also coming forward saying, I never knew you did that at work. So it's yeah. kind of, it's, you know, it's, it's, a great, it's a great show. I'm, 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 really, I'm really proud that we've, that we've made it and stuff. So, yeah. Well, thank you for talking to us today. So Pleasure. we're talking about traveling with pets. Mm. Now, we get lots of people asking us about traveling with cats, with budgerigars. <laughs> There's lots of content on the internet about traveling with a dog. Mm-hmm. And we'll come to that, and particularly around going to Europe, which mm-hmm. I want to touch base on as well, because obviously rules have changed since Brexit. But what would be best practice with traveling with any animal for an owner, would you say? Gosh, well... I think, I mean, traveling with pets, it's, it's definitely becoming more and more popular. People mm. want to, you know, we, we see pets as a part of our family and we, I feel exactly the same with Dolly. You know, we've, we have a camper van, we take it up to Scotland, she comes with us every single time. But I think it's always about making sure that you're able to pr- continue to provide everything that your pet needs whilst you're away. So for dogs, that's, I, I would argue, a little bit easier because they, they are, you know, sort of slightly more dependent on us. So we can sort of make sure that we can offer them everything that we need. I think with more sort of unusual species, so, you know, maybe reptiles or birds, like you say, budges, parrots, it is doable, but I think it's always about making sure that you can still provide for those quite specific needs of that animal if you are traveling with them. So, you know, if that's a bird or if it's a reptile, making sure that their environment is still safe, that you you can provide everything they need in terms of the temperature controls, you know, all those little things that that could be quite tra- could be quite tricky if you're traveling with them. And then cats, you know, we do see people travel with cats, um, but again, I think cats are quite independent, and to sort of have them on leads and things like that, there's there's pros and cons. Some cats cope with that very very well. Other cats will really freak out if you try and restrict their sort of moving around their own environment almost mm-hmm. you know so and again obviously if a cat escapes from the from the van or the camper van or the or the motorhome that, there's there's all sorts of worries around that as well so I think it's making sure that you know your own pet very well I think it's making sure that you can provide for them whilst you are away uh and and, and it's just sort of being mindful that what what might feel right to us might not necessarily be quite right for our pets as well mm. You were saying as well about getting the animal acclimatised. If you're travelling from, you know, here we are, it's two degrees outside, mm-hmm. or probably less than that today. Um, if you're heading to southern France, that's a very different environment when you arrive, isn't it, mm. for you and for the pet? Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, again, we can put lots of preparation in for ourselves. So, you know, you take sun hats, we take sun cream, blah, blah, blah. But I think, again, it's having that sort of forethought to think, okay, but how will how will the dog cope in that heat? You know, it's, it's sort of making sure that you plan your meals out around, can you leave them in the van safely or not? Or mm. would you need to take them with you? And in which case, you need to make sure that those restaurants are pet friendly. 
you know, making sure there's plenty of shade, always having water with you, um, you know, taking regular breaks, all those little things that are, are, when you're excited about a holiday, you know, you often overlook some of those things, don't you? Because you just think, oh, we can do all this different stuff. You know, but actually when you've got a dog in tow, if you've got a pet in tow, it can change what you're actually able to do. And, and that's just really worth keeping in mind as well. Thank you. That's great advice. So what <clears throat> I noticed that there's regulations around dogs, cats and ferrets, ferrets going right. to Europe, but nothing <laughs> yeah. else. Why is that? Uh, I think, well, there is regulations around birds as well. So there are health certificates that you need to apply if you're traveling with birds. Other animals, so, uh, I mean, rodents, rabbits, most invertebrates, invertebrates amphibians, some reptiles, they, there aren't actually any restrictions around that. I think often what happens is the pet travel scheme, as animal lovers, as pet owners, we think it's to protect our, our pets, but actually the, the pet travels sort of regulations, it used to be a pet travel scheme, but pet travel is all about protecting human health. So it's basically the risk of things like rabies entering our country. Um, so I think that's that's possibly why it's more geared up for the, the dogs, the cats and ferrets, mm. um, in terms of rabies risk to human health. So let's talk about going to Europe then. Mm -hmm. And since Brexit, rules have changed. Um, that's very well documented. Um, but can you just talk us through the process? We're, we're doing this in the middle of winter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and there's a good reason for that, isn't there? Because there's up to a four month lead time that mm -hmm. people need to bear in mind. Can you talk us through that process, James? That, let's talk in terms of a dog yeah. um, and going to France. Okay, so traveling to the EU is the, the actual rules for anybody that has traveled before haven't changed huge in terms of what you need to do. So that's a, a microchip first, then there's a rabies vaccination, there's a compulsory 21 day wait period, and then you can travel to Europe and back again on what we call now an animal health certificate instead of the pet passport. So the the the, the kind of the overall sort of system and 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 points to check in all of that are, are pretty similar. And then again, coming back to the UK, you still need to see a vet where you are in France, for example, uh, 24 hours to five days before your return to the UK. So all of that is pretty much the same as it was when we had the pet passports. The big difference, though, is that instead of being able to travel freely on that pet passport, as long as your rabies is in date, we now have to have an animal health certificate for every single trip that you're going to make abroad. So the animal health certificate is a very wordy, long document. It's about 12 pages long, um, and it has to be completed by the vet before you travel. So that has to be done. It's 10 days minimum before you travel, but I would never suggest that you leave it that long because if there are any delays in your travel, then if you're reaching that nine to 10 day limit and then your ferry is delayed by six or seven hours, then that could tip you over. By the time you actually reach France, then, then you're gonna be out of date for your travel certificate. Um, so having having that little bit of sort of planning ahead of time, so it's 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 got to be issued within 10 days of travel, but then it lasts for four months whilst you are abroad. So that's a continual tra um, travel within Europe once you're there, within the EU once you're there. And then you've got to come back to the, the UK within that four month period. Which of course, as humans, we, we're only allowed 90 days. <laughs> yeah, so quite what that means for your pets, I've got no idea, but I would please don't leave your pets there. <laughs> no. It's an odd disparity, which I've never understood. No. So, no. And this, of course, is for UK residents, isn't it? If you're, mm. if you're an EU citizen, mm -hmm. you don't need to do that. Is that right? So the EU still has got their pet passports. Interestingly, though, this does also apply for Northern Ireland. So if you're traveling to Northern Ireland, you would also need to follow these same rules. Right. Okay, that's interesting. So the first thing is a microchip. Mm -hmm. Some dogs have a tattoo. Mm -hmm. Is that accepted? Yeah, so tattoos, if they're in place prior to the rabies vaccination, then you can go on the dog's tattoo rather than a microchip. But that, it's quite rare that, to be honest, but normally I would still suggest having a microchip in place um, on top of a tattoo because actually the microchip, as well as it being a compulsory part of traveling with your pets, it's just a great safety measure. So that, you know, the microchip details then link straight back to a database which has got all of your name, address, telephone numbers and things like that. So it's exactly the same microchip that would implant as a, as a recommendation for all dogs. It's actually a legal requirement in dogs to have a microchip by eight weeks anyway. So all dogs should have a microchip regardless. Um, but just in case there are, that, that question comes up, I would always suggest that you still just get a microchip on top of a tattoo. So I want to travel to France in three weeks time from today. Mm -hmm. And I'm a new dog owner. Mm -hmm. Can I go? So you need to come and see the vets. 
we would put the microchip in if it's not there already. You would then have the rabies vaccination, but day one would count from tomorrow, and then you'd have to count 21 days, and then, yes, you could go, as long as you have your animal health certificate um, in place. So I'm cutting it fine then. So You're preparing really early fine. is it? The other thing is that you've got to actually find a vet that's able to issue these certificates as well. Now, that's another point of interest, is that not all vets can issue this certificate, can they? Why is that? So this is basically because this is a government document, the, the animal health certificate is, is a government issued piece of paperwork. So only we call them official veterinarians. So only OVs can actually issue the, the certificate. So any vet can administer the rabies vaccination, but it has to be an OV that actually signs off all the paperwork. And practices don't have to do this. Practices don't. Some practices won't even have OVs working within the practice. Um, some practices choose not to do it because it's so time consuming. And so it's just not a service that they're able to, to, to offer. Uh, but essentially, if that means that within a practice of, you know, it could be five or six vets, so you might normally be able to get an appointment pretty easily. If only one of those vets is actually an OV, you're going to have to find an appointment that's suiting, that fits into their schedule sort of thing. So it can be, it can be quite difficult sometimes to get an, a last minute appointment for a, for a travel certificate. So yeah, forward planning, talk to your practice, mm -hmm. have that communication. Uh, give us your dates of travel we can work back with you and we'll do everything we can to make sure that you've got everything or your ducks lined up in a row as it were um, but ultimately the responsibility falls down on the person that's traveling um, you know because there's different rules for each different country as well of course yeah and what does this all actually cost well that again can vary practice to practice um, I think there's been some backlash from the cost of these animal health certificates, which I can understand because previously you used to be able to travel very freely on the single passport. But the reality is, is that it does take about 40 minutes for a vet to fill this paperwork in. So that's the equivalent maybe of two consult slots. So the price then reflects the time it takes the vet to fill this out. So you know, it can be sort of anything between 80 to 120 pounds for a vet to fill this, this certificate in, which I, I fully appreciate from a pet owner's point of view is very frustrating just for a piece of paper, essentially. But like I say, it's got to be an official vet. They've gone through extra qualifications. It takes two consult slots out of a vet's time. Travel, you know, it's it's a it's a luxury, isn't it? It's not it's not compulsory. Nobody has to do this. So it's a very it's 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 a bit of a it's a bit of a tricky it's a bit of a tricky area. But the other frustrating thing, and I, again for pet owners, is that if you are regularly traveling, you need a new animal health certificate for every single trip that you're making. Which suddenly, if you want to go abroad you know, for a few long weekends, or if you've got a place abroad, if you're lucky enough to have a house in France, which would be lovely, um, you know, that means a new animal health certificate for every single trip you make, which suddenly can become quite a costly uh, way to travel with your pets. It certainly has become more expensive, isn't it? I've read some places charging up to £300 oh, wow. to issue an animal health certificate, which is, that's just ludicrous, I mean, that's isn't it? a lot. I'd say that's top end of, mm. of most places. But, you know, again, there's no... There is no set fee on it. Different practices will, 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 can, can yeah. charge what they feel appropriate. So ask the cost before you embark on engaging your vet, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the best thing with, with any veterinary treatments, with any veterinary intervention. I think estimates and knowing what stuff is going to cost as much as you can up front before you just book stuff in is, is, is what I'd always recommend anyway. Now, travelling out of Europe has become much easier as well particularly since we left. <laughs> so what are the guidelines for people looking to travel through Europe and further, perhaps further east? Do you, can you help us with that? So that does start to become a bit more complicated in terms of listed and non-listed EU and non-EU countries. So there's a list of countries that you can travel to with your dog, cat and ferret under the animal health certificate and you can travel there like we said and come back fairly easily beyond that it starts to become more what we call an export health certificate which can be a whole plethora of different rules and regulations designed by that country that you're trying to enter and that can vary so much between different places so sometimes it's very simple you know it's just simply a, a rabies vaccination a wait period and off you go other places, it's extra vaccinations, it's extra flea and worming treatments, it's timed flea and worming treatments, you know, and there's all these different things that you have to make sure everything fits in place. But that will vary country to country. So 
I th my only advice really on that would be that, again, if you're planning to go to one of those countries that's not listed as being part of the animal health certificate, then contact the government, contact DEFRA or the APHA, the Animal, Plant and Health Agency, and they will be able to give you a notes for guidance, which is then all of the sort of intricacies of that particular country that you're trying to get to, and then you can start to work back. But it can take, I mean, some of these countries, some of the, some of the rules can sort of start five, six months before you're traveling. So again, really forward planning is, is the key there. Mm, yeah. Now, as the owner of a motorhome hire business, we do often get asked, can I take my pet with us on holiday? Mm -hmm. And the first question we have is, well, what's the pet? Mm -hmm. And then we ask, are they used to traveling? And sometimes we will say no. Mm. Um, but what is your advice to people who are looking to take a pet, whatever it might be, into a car journey or motorhome or camper van trip for the first time? It's a good question. I think I think that, that there is that sort of feeling that whenever we're going on holiday, we want the pets to stay with us, we want them to be a part of it. But it's, again, it's kind of making sure that that's going to be right for them. So, you know, dogs, cats, maybe that could work. And there's, there's some tips around how to make sure that they travel safely and comfortably. But then I think some of the other species that we see, so maybe sort of rabbits or reptiles, especially, I think reptiles would be a really good example where, you know, the, the, to keep a reptile in a vivarium is very specific. They need a temperature gradient, they need the right lighting, you know, and often the food that they need can, needs to be very sort of stored very particularly you know if that's frozen for example so to try and make sure that you can provide for everything they need whilst on the move I think is a real challenge and uh, you know nothing's impossible don't get me wrong but I just think sometimes which is because we want to do it doesn't necessarily mean that, that or just because we can do it doesn't even necessarily mean that we should that we should do it if mm. that's the case so I think making sure that you can provide for them throughout the entire duration of your trip is is, is really key there uh, if a pet's never traveled before I think you know, it is worth, again, putting some thought into that. So especially for dogs, you know, some dogs really find car travel quite quite upsetting. So they can find it very scary. They can sometimes vomit. Um, you know, so building that car travel up from a young age is, is a really good shout. Making sure that they feel comfortable in the car or the, or the, or the van. Um, having a safe place for them to get to. So, you know, you might start making them feel comfortable in a bed maybe or, or start making some really positive associations with the van generally so whilst it's stationary at home or wherever you are if you're able to you know spend some time just in and out of the van without it going anywhere um, we do have medication some people talk about sedations I don't particularly like to sedate pets for travel because I think there's there's pros and cons to that uh, but we have got certain things that we can offer in terms of calming options um, and we have got anti-sickness tablets as well but again, I would say if you need to contact your vet to talk to us about that, I think you also do have to question whether it's right to be taking that mm. type of a pet on, on holiday with you. If they hate it that much, that we're having to use anti-sickness and anti, you know, sort of calming medications and stuff, then I think there's, there's also that question there. Well, that could be useful, though, isn't it? On a ferry, mm. if you haven't got a pet cabin, which, you know, certain ferry companies offer those which you can you can buy for the trip but if you leave your dog in the car that that car deck those car alarms are going off constantly mm. i don't know if you've ever noticed the yeah. noise is horrendous mm. and for our own border terrier he would hate that mm. you know he doesn't hate much but i can imagine he'd be very uncomfortable with that constant shrieking of car alarms and i guess then maybe a sedation is an option but in terms of going back to dogs there are some very clear rules and guidelines aren't there about securing a dog mm. um, not necessarily in a crate no so the wording is a bit ambiguous around it in terms of how far do you need to go to make sure your dog's secure the, the key is to make sure that the dogs aren't free so some people use seat belts some people use cars different harnesses all these different things you just need to be able to to, to prove that your dog is secure within the vehicle um, but I think crates are great. I think crates are actually a really useful tool if you are traveling with your pets, because again, if you are going out and about, sometimes if you're in motorhomes or, or things like that, you know, we kind of, everything's compact, isn't it? So you're trying to sort of, you know, you get back from a walk, for example, and you, you know, you sort of, everyone's trying to sort of get dry and get clean and things like that. And actually having a crate there to just put the dog into safely whilst you get everything else sorted out. And then you can go back to them knowing that they are at least safe and sound whilst you're just getting mm. things prepared. I think is great. So I think crate training, but again, 
crates are all about making sure that the dog feels secure in them, they feel safe, they feel comfortable in them. It's not about just going and buying a crate and for the first time ever, whilst you're on holiday, the dog goes in a crate suddenly, because that's super stressful as well. So yeah. everything's just about normalizing whatever it is that you're expecting them to do on holiday. Try and start that well before you go, and then they'll be much more comfortable whilst you're away. It's all about familiarization for everyone, isn't it? hundred yeah. percent, yeah. And routine. Routine, exactly, yeah. yeah. Now, we were talking earlier about traveling to countries south of the UK, and you were telling me, too, about certain diseases that dogs particularly can contract that we don't have here in Britain mm. that don't necessarily get tested for. Can you explain a bit more about that? Yeah, so this is something that we're seeing more and more in practice. These kind of diseases that traditionally we'd have thought of as not being a problem within the UK, we're starting to see more and more animals coming over with them. But if you're traveling with your pet down to, for example, the Mediterranean or, or sort of southern Spain, places like that, there are diseases there that we don't see in the UK. So we're probably not that used to, to sort of preventing against them. So things like heartworm, leishmaniasis, ehrlichiosis, uh, and these are often spread by insects. So that might be ticks, mosquitoes, it could be sandflies. So whilst the pet travel rules don't necessarily dictate that you have to put any prevention sort of medication in place for these diseases as a vet i would really urge you to 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 go that extra mile and offer a really broad thorough parasite prevention treatment whilst you're abroad as well and then that'll just help to reduce the risk of them actually picking up um, any of these diseases that are down there so this is something people should do before they travel yeah so ideally i'll put some a, a treatment maybe sort of one month most of them are monthly applications so not all of them but mostly so a month before you go and then take them with you and treat whilst you're abroad as well interestingly the tapeworm treatment you can't take that with you for the vet to apply over there they have to administer and prescribe that themselves within the practice but the other medication the preventative medicine you can certainly take with you and then just keep treatment whilst you're whilst you're abroad as well now there are some requirements with regard to tapeworm treatments as mm -hmm. well particularly about coming back into the uk can you explain a bit more for that absolutely so yeah the tapeworm treatment basically needs to be given it's 24 hours to five days before you return to great britain so it's and then that's recorded on the animal health certificate there are some exemptions to that so if you're coming directly from either finland malta norway ireland or northern ireland you don't need to have a tapeworm treatment um, but even then i would always recommend parasite control as part of your general travel kind of you know um approach because you never know what type of parasites we're going to be coming into contact with uh, so so yeah so it needs to be given one to five days before your return now it, another kind of strange little kind of loophole on that is that if you're going for a very short trip if you're only going for a long weekend some people will actually give the tapeworm treatments in the UK before you go as long as you wait 24 hours then travel you can come back within the five days and that tapeworm treatment that you've been given in the UK will count on the certificate as being the tapeworm treatment, which would save you then having to see a vet when you're over there as well. So how long does a tapeworm treatment last for then? Well, the, the tapeworm treatment itself normally only lasts, most of these drugs only stay in the system for well, a, a matter of days, really. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much about a prolonged treatment. It's just about making sure that there's been a kind of a, like a clear out of, the, of any potential tapeworm that, that might have been picked up within that period of time that you're traveling. So you could potentially, if you've got a holiday home, you're just going for the weekend, get your tapeworm treatment here <clears throat> in the UK and go to France, Italy, and then come back mm. and not have to see a vet whilst you're over there. Yeah, exactly. But of course, if you then end up staying beyond that five days, you would need to wait another 24 hours before you then do see a vet to then be able to get back within the next five days. <laughs> Does wow. that make sense? Yeah, it does, yeah. <laughs> so planning is really the key, it's isn't it? It's so important. It's yeah. so important. And also, you know, vets abroad, they're exactly like they are here. You might not be able to just turn up on the doorstep and say, can you give my dog a tapeworm treatment? You need to find a practice, make sure that they're able to complete the certificate as well, mm. book in ahead of time and go and, you know, there will probably be a consultation fee on that. And then they administer the tapeworm treatment, mark it all up on the certificate, and then you're free to travel back down, back to here. So the big takeaways are, as we say, planning and also budgeting as well, is because it's become expensive, hasn't it? It really has, and I think that's that's definitely something to factor in now. Mm. You know, when I think a lot of the time people, especially at the moment, we're going into this, you know, the cost of living crisis. Everybody's looking at everything really in terms of where you can save money, and I think traveling with your pets. It used to be that actually 
that was relatively doable for, for, for lots of people if you're going on holiday and often would probably work out cheaper than using either a kennels or a pet sitters. Whereas now, I think there's an argument that that might have changed a little bit. And actually, there's some great pet sitters around. You know, if you find, some, if you find something that works or friends and family and things like that, you know, it's, it, I think it's definitely worth having a think about. Mm. Certainly. James, thank you so much for inviting us into your lovely home for this conversation. It's been great to talk to you Good. and thank you for letting us unpack your brain <laughs> <laughs> no, as pleasure. we try and figure our way through this. I don't know how, I don't know if you found anything in there, but I'm very happy to help. <laughs> Much appreciated. Thank no you. Worries. Thank you. Well, I hope you found that useful. And if you're planning on heading off on a motorhome adventure, then make sure you plan ahead. That seems to be the key. Thank you again, Reggie. You've been an absolute star this week. And of course, to Dog Robes, who very proudly sponsor this episode. You can find out more at thatleisureshop.com where enter the code REGGIE15. Yeah, it's after you, mate. R-E-G-G-I-E-1-5 and get 15% off your order for your dog robe. They come in six sizes, a range of colours. Go and have a look. They're absolutely brilliant. I'm loving the gauntlets. <laughs> and if you've still got questions about travelling with your pet, you can ask us. You can submit them at motorhomemat.co.uk forward slash ask Matt. Just click the orange button, record your question. Please tell us where you are in the country and ask your question. You can just fill in the form and email it to us as well. But we love to hear your voice. And on the website while you're there, you'll find all the places you can listen to the Motorhome Matt podcast. And don't forget, you can watch us on YouTube as well. Just search for Motorhome Matt.